Welcome back friends. Uh, let us uh, begin our next module uh, which is on uh, non-motorized transportation. Uh, we have uh, looked at so far at the five basic steps of uh, planning for uh, non-motorized transportation. Now we will get into the details of uh, bicycles and pedestrians one by one. Uh, in this lecture, we will be looking at the characteristics of pedestrians and bicycles and get into the traffic flow equations and the factors that affect pedestrian speed. Now when we are going to uh, plan or design any facility, you have to understand who you are designing it for. So at a broad level, uh, pedestrians are defined as any person on foot, right? Anybody who is walking is a pedestrian. However, while planning for pedestrians, we also plan for people who walk, not only walk, sit or stand in public spaces, uses a walking stick, crutches or a wheelchair. We look at different types of uh, people, old or young, workers or residents, as well as shoppers who are shopping on the in the market area along the streets. Right? This is a definition uh, given in IRC codes. So, uh, it kind of encompasses everybody who is on foot, who is standing, who is uh, running, playing around, a mother with a toddler in the stroller, uh, a person on a wheelchair that is being pushed by another person. So, all, so when you are looking at uh, designing any pedestrian facility, we are looking at each and every one of them. And also remember, every motorist is a pedestrian in some part of the trip, right? Even if you are driving a car, you have to get to your car. So while you are getting or uh, accessing your car, you are most likely walking to your car. So facilities such as um, uh, footpaths or sidewalks that lead up to a parking facility, they have to be designed uh, in mind, uh, keeping in mind the accessibility needs of the motorized people as well. Now when we look at the space requirements for each pedestrian, uh, they are usually uh, determined by the ellipse that the our body forms. If you look at our body from uh, from the top, uh, the top view of the body, then we will see our head which is in this black circle and the shoulders, the grey elliptical as well as the buffer area that is needed for free movement of your arms, right. When you walk, your arms swing. So, there is some free uh, buffer area that is needed by each and every person in order to walk freely. So, this is your body width and this is your body depth. So, these are the basic dimensions, uh, these are the basic elements of the body which has to be taken into consideration while you design for pedestrians, while you design any facility for pedestrians. Now, there are different values that are used based on the average person in that country, right? Uh, some of the countries may have uh, average height and width of the body uh, different versus some other countries may have heights and width different. So, uh, in the uh, highway capacity manual that was developed in the United States, they usually use the value of 0.6 meters for the body width and 0.5 meters for the body depth. Whereas the Indo highway capacity manual that was developed in India, we use a body width of 0.51 and a body depth of 0.35 meters. In addition, the Indo HCM also defines that more often than not, we do carry a luggage on our shoulder. So, we have to give an extra uh, uh, body depth of 0.52 meters. So, we have to give an extra body depth of about 0.15 meters which in, in addition to the 0.35 meters so that we can plan for any people for an average person who is actually walking on the street with something on his or her shoulder. Okay? So, this is the average, these are the average values that can be used for designing any pedestrian facility. Next, uh, how do we define a cyclist? any person using physical power driven cycles, right? physical power driven. Now there are electric cycles, electric bikes that are coming out. So those, those do not fall 
in this realm. Uh, in this realm, we only find bicycles, uh, tricycles and sometimes your vendor cards that have to be uh, taken into consideration while you are designing for cycling. Okay? People who, who use cycles, three wheel rickshaws or four wheel carts, uh, this should be carts, uh, are included as cyclists. It is very important that uh, we uh, plan for cyclists as well. Uh, sometimes it is noticed that uh, walking, although it does not get a lot of uh, uh, importance while we are traveling, uh, while we are looking at transportation, but it gets significant uh, importance when we are looking at urban transportation. However, cycling is still uh, not getting uh, its due uh, importance despite the high number of cyclists that are on our urban streets. So, it is very, very important to take into consideration cyclists along with people who walk into consideration while we design for an empty uh, infrastructure. Now, similar to, uh, similar to uh, you know, the body ellipse, uh, with, there are also standard dimensions for any uh, bicycles. Uh, normal bicycle would be such and we will give you the dimensions in the next couple of slides, but we are looking at the width or the length of the bicycle. We are also looking at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the circumference or the um, diameter of the uh, wheel. We are looking at the entire height and also the handles, the length of the handle. So, that is an important diameter that we have to look at along with the pedal width, pedal length as well. So, these all play an important role while we are planning for bicycles because the handle is the one that will turn the bicycle in the direction. So, it has to be, it has to have free maneuverability, it has to have space to maneuver. So, that uh, dimension of the handle is also important. Uh, now, in the Indian context, we also consider uh, uh, goods that will be transported along the, uh, on a bicycle. So, in order to consider the goods, uh, standards look at either uh, either uh, um, uh, one uh, one piece of luggage or good on each side of the cycle. So, in this case, it is shown as a cylinder, but it could be anything. However, it is restricted. We usually uh, restrict them to a certain width. We do not encourage that uh, very wide objects be carried on bicycles. Uh, similarly, there are uh, standard dimensions for uh, cycle rickshaws as well as carts that are used to ferry vegetables. Now, here are uh, all the dimensions that are given in one slide. These are as per IRC code 11 uh, in 2015. You would see that an adult touring bike has a, uh, has a length, uh, has a standard length of uh, 1,950 millimeters, whereas an uh, adult touring bike, bike with goods uh, would still have uh, the same length, but it would have a different width with rider, right? There will be, uh, so these are all, uh, both may be called uh, riders. So, those, that is the only difference between when you are carrying goods versus when you are riding alone. When you are riding alone, you would, uh, the width to be considered is 750 meters. Similarly, different dimensions are given uh, uh, for uh, passenger rickshaws, for good rickshaws and modified good rickshaws. Now, the next thing to consider uh, when we are looking at uh, NMT uh, infrastructure are the traffic flow and the capacity of the facility that you are trying to build. Now, these uh, basic uh, uh, terminology are all borrowed from vehicular traffic or motorized traffic, but they also apply in case of non-motorized transportation, right? So, the basic equation says that flow Q is a product of speed U and density K, right? So, that is the basic equation. Flow is equal to u times k. 
Now the speed will vary as per the NMT mode, its characteristics and the built environment. Right? So, we will look now further into what are the elements that affects the speed of pedestrians specifically before we get into bicycles and then uh, in the coming lecture we will explain these three diagrams in much more detail. So, what are the characteristics of pedestrians that affect speed? Now, why do you first point is why do you need to look into the speed of pedestrians while designing for pedestrian facilities? A because you need to understand how many people can be accommodated along any facility. Right? So, for example, if you have a sidewalk, you need to know how many people will a sidewalk accommodate per uh, unit time. Right? So, if people are constantly moving or some people are standing, so you have to take into consideration them as well. Some people may be standing, some people may be walking at a fast speed, some people may be walking at a slower speed. So, maybe on an average you can accommodate certain number of people per unit time. So, that people per unit time will give you actually the capacity of that facility. So, given length of sidewalk, given width of sidewalk, you can accommodate n number of people per unit time. So, this n per unit time depends upon how quickly people move across that facility. Right? Even if it is a uh, crosswalk, for example, if it is a zebra crossing and people are trying to cross the road along the zebra crossing, you still need to know how fast the people can move across, what is the width of the road that they are crossing in order for you to give the signal sufficient pedestrian walk time for them to cross, a, cross the street. So, that is those are the two basic primary reasons for which you need to know what, what are the factors that affect speed. Right? The basic, basic factors that affect speed are the age of the people that are on the facility, their gender. So, women tend to speak, uh, tend to walk uh, uh, slower than the men. The trip purpose. So, if you are walking to go to office or walking to catch a train or walking to for some uh, urgent purpose, then you would walk faster. Whereas, if you are shopping and walking and uh, looking at different kind of stores or you are walking with friends, you would be walking slower. Uh, speed also depends on whether you are carrying any bags or not and also whether if you are walking with a group or with some group of people or not. Right? These are different types of just pedestrians which are also factors that affect their speed. Now, if you look at the built environment characteristics, so for example, where you are walking, right? that also affects your speed. So, if you are walking on a road that has some uh, high gradient, right? if uh, the, road, the road is very up and down, then your speed will vary. Walkway width, now if it is a very narrow uh, sidewalk, right? then automatically you are uh, aware or you are very uh, conscious of the fact that you are very close to the, uh, the vehicles that are moving very fast on the road. So, you tend to be away walking little bit away from the vehicles and then tend to be very careful that you do not uh, step onto the carriageway. So, that automatically kind of reduces your speed and on top of it if there are lot of people walking on that narrow footpath, then your speed gets reduced. The curb and the street furniture. right? So, now if you have lot of um, say for example, trees in between the sidewalk. Now, this is a very uh, tricky situation. Uh, we do need trees for pedestrians uh, to feel comfortable while they are walking because they provide shade and trees uh, overall are a very essential part of the urban infrastructure, urban green infrastructure. But at the same time, if they are right in between your path of uh, your walking path in the middle of the sidewalk, that causes some uh, inconvenience to pedestrians because now they have to walk around the tree. They have to bypass the tree which kind of again reduces the speed. So, this, this factor not only reduces the speed, but it also 
causes a minor inconvenience to the uh, pedestrians who might be uh, wanting to walk the shortest distance between the two points and not go on a winding path. Uh, well, it, again it depends on the purpose, if you are leisurely walking then you would want to, you would enjoy walking on winding paths, but if you have some other purpose, some urgent purpose, you would not, you would prefer that you walk fast. So that is one of the things and there are other things such as benches and sometimes of course the footpath is encroached upon, sometimes two wheelers are parked on sidewalk or sometimes even four wheelers are parked on sidewalks or footpaths. So those all cause great deal of inconvenience and also reduces the speed of pedestrians. Now two way friction is the other thing, if uh, there is only a sidewalk on one side of the road and no footpath on the other side of the road, then all the people usually tend to walk on the side of the road that has footpath and so you have a two way traffic on one footpath, two way pedestrian traffic, two way pedestrian footfall on one side of the, uh, on, on the footpath. So that again causes a lot of friction between uh, pedestrians walking in both directions and that friction reduces the speed. Uh, last but not the least of course location effect, so you are walking uh, through uh, uh, an area that has many things to see, uh, museums, um, uh, good uh, restaurants, good shops then automatically your speed goes down because you want to uh, slow down and appreciate the environment through which you are walking and so the speed reduces. So this gives you an idea of what are the factors that uh, the speed of a pedestrian depends upon. Now based on the different types of pedestrians there are some average values of speed that can be used, right. Based on age you can say that uh, the average speed at which people walk are usually is usually 1.2 meters per second, right. The elderly walk a little bit slower, 1 meter per second. Now when it comes to uh, gender, men versus women, uh, mean walking speed of men are about 81 uh, meters per minute, whereas women walk a little bit slower of 76 meters per minute. When it comes to trip purpose, work trips like we discussed already generally are faster than leisure trips and of course if you have baggage you are uh, walking uh, much slower uh, than uh, if you do not have a baggage and similarly so platooning effect is this, we often, uh, we often walk two or three friends together and when we are walking together our speed usually decreases. Okay. So, uh, I mean uh, remember we also should be um, um, planning for pedestrians with luggage. Uh, so this is an, a typical example say, so when you are planning for a pedestrian facility for example uh, a platform on a railway station, you, you have to take into account the people who help us with the luggage uh, and plan for them as well. Now when it comes to built environment and its effect on speed, it has been seen that 10 units uh, when, the, uh, uh, when, when there are uh, 10 units of rise in every 100 units of length, right. So when there is 10 units of rise in every 100 units of length on uphill grades, there is a 0.1 meter per second reduction in speed. So as an, uh, as an uh, when the gradient becomes steeper and steeper, your for every 10 units of rise in 100 units of length, your speed reduces by 0.1 meter per second. No measurable effect on speed up to grades of 3 percent. So up to 3 percent grade, you do not have much effect on speed, but once the grade is steeper than 3 percent, then you are kind of worried. Pedestrian tend to keep, okay, when, so this is what we were talking about when there is a lot of uh, uh, street furniture and the, and the curb is too close to the uh, motorized vehicles, pedestrians tend to keep 0.3 to 0.45 meter lateral clearance from the curb line, right. So we tend to walk a little bit away from the curb line so that we are away from the motorized traffic. So 
then the average space occupied by the pedestrians and the average space occupied by the pedestrians are 72 to 79 meters square. So, one person on an average occupies anywhere, so maybe an average of 75 meters square uh, on that uh, footpath. So, given this lateral uh, uh, distance that we leave along the from the curb line and that space that we actually need to travel, there is an impact on speed. Uh, in case of two way friction, speed and capacity decreases by 15 percent when the flow proportion is 10 percent. So, when there is a 90 to 10 directional split, so the 90 percent of the people are walking in one direction, 10 percent is walking on the other direction, there is already a reduction about 15 percent of the maximum speed at which they can uh, walk on the sidewalk or footpath. At 50-50 capacity of a two way uh, facility is equal to a one way sidewalk facility. So, if you have uh, 50 percent of the people walking in one direction and 50 percent of the people walking in the other direction, it is as good as having the sidewalk a one way sidewalk right that a two way that the capacity of a two way sidewalk is as good as one way sidewalk. So, it reduces the speed causes a reduction in the capacity as well. Now, here are some uh, 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 examples from various researches that have been done in different countries. So, you would see research from India, Iraq, Bangladesh, New Zealand, Canada, Sri Lanka, Thailand and Malaysia as well as uh, Israel. So, you would see that how the walking speeds differ based on weather, based on all these different conditions. right? So, you would see that it seems like New Zealand, in New Zealand the mean speed is the highest, right? the green color mean speed is the highest, Nine, or almost, almost uh, just a little bit less than 90 meters per minute. Uh, if you look at India, uh, different studies say different things. Uh, one study uh, has said that speed is anywhere just above 70, maybe 75. The other study uh, says it is right, it is less than 70 uh, and let us see. So, it is around 70. So, I think uh, under Indian conditions, it is safe to say that uh, the average speed of pedestrians is somewhere around 70 meters per minute, the mean speed, right. Then the speed varies based on whether you have luggage, whether you are uh, older than 60 years old, uh, older than 60. Uh, whether you are an uh, adult or whether you are less than 15 years old and whether you are a male or a female. So, this gives you an idea of the speed as a function of location slash socio cultural climatic effect, right? because all these countries have different climatic effects, different social cultural environment. So, you can see how speed varies depending upon that. Now, so a very important question. Uh, is often asked that how do you identify this variation in speed among different group among two groups. Say for example, if you want to know whether actually uh, the speed between uh, men and women are different or not or whether actually the speed between people who are carrying uh, luggage versus people who are not is different or not. Right? Many times the speeds are so close to each other. Uh, that you feel that well, that does not seem to be any significant difference, but uh, statistically you are always required to uh, see or check whether those speeds are different or not. So, what we usually use uh, statistical uh, test that we usually use is an independent sample t test. Okay? So, how do we do that? First, you need to identify the groups for which you are testing for the difference. For example, are you testing for uh, difference between uh, uh, different ages of people, uh, the speeds of different ages of people or gender or gradient. So, identify your groups. Next, you have to collect speed data for that group, right? sample speed data for that group. You need to collect for the two groups for which you are trying to find the statistically significant difference. In step 3, what you need to do is you need to 
calculate the sum of their differences as well as the square of the differences between the two groups. So, you will have a mean speed of uh, you will have the speeds of one group, you will have the speeds of the other group, you have to calculate the sum of the differences, you have the difference of the speeds, you have to sum it up and similarly you have to find out the summation of the squares of the differences. Then the T statistic which is given by this equation which I am sure very uh, many of you would know if you are not aware, uh, it is available in any of uh, the common statistical uh, textbooks. So, you need to calculate what is called the T statistic which is a modulus T does not uh, matter of uh, whether it is a positive or negative sign. So, it is a modulus and it will it will be based on the number of samples for which you have collected the data. So, how many samples you collect it depends upon that uh, sample size. Then you calculate what is called the degrees of freedom which is nothing but the number of sample size minus 1 and finally, you will have a table a t statistic table that will tell you what is the p value or the critical t value based on uh, uh, for standard p values right. What is the t critical value for standard p values usually the p value that we use is 0 0.05 that means, it is statistically significant at 95 percent. So, we usually look at 0 0.05 if nothing is specified you look at 0 0.05 and you will find the some t critical value for your degrees of freedom. For example, if your degrees of freedom is 2 then your t critical value will be 4.3. So, now the value that you have calculated in the previous step t modulus if that is less than your t critical value then the inference would be that there is significant difference between the speeds of the two groups. Okay? So, that is how you find out whether there is significant difference between the two sets of groups which you are interested in finding out and then you would know that okay, yes there is significant difference and hence we need to take into cognizance these significant different uh, speeds and design for them accordingly. If there is no significant difference then you can say that you have a pretty homogeneous group of people who are walking on that facility and you can design. Uh, the facility for an average or a mean speed of the entire uh, uh, walking population along that facility. Okay? So, let us quickly look at uh, a simple example that will allow you to understand all the calculations. Now, say that you have collected the speeds of 10 different males, 10 different males and 10 different females. Okay? So, your uh, uh, your uh, uh, um, uh, your aim is to find out whether these speeds are whether the mean speeds between these two groups are statistically significantly different or not. Okay? So, the data collection was done, the groups were identified. Now, you had to calculate the t statistic. So, what you need to do first is to find out the differences between each right? 72 minus 69 and so on and so forth and then sum it up. Similarly, you need to find the squares of the differences and finally, sum it up. Then you can use these formulas uh, here and put up these values. So, this is summation of, summation, uh, of the differences by the sample size. So, it is 32 by the sample size is 10, right? Uh, then the whole square root of uh, square of the summations, so that is 256 minus that is the summation 32 to the power 2 by n that is 10 and this is n into n minus 1 10 into 9. So, the answer would be 0 0.02004. Now, you need to know what is the t critical value for uh, for the degrees of freedom of 10 minus 1 9 right n is 10. So, 10 minus 1 9. So, if you look at the table the standard table that you have for 0 0.05 and degrees of freedom 10 or degrees of freedom 9, I am sorry, degrees of freedom 9, your t critical value is 2.262. So, what that means is your t value is less than your t critical, which means there is a significant difference between the speeds of male and female. So, that tells you that uh, if you are trying to 
uh, plan a facility at that location, a footpath or whatever it may be, that there are significant different speeds of all the females and the males that walk on that road and hence you have to take into account both of these groups when you are planning for this facility. I hope that is clear. That ends uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, again, uh, the references are given from which all the different uh, uh, exercises and the matter is taken for your further reading. In conclusion, what we looked at this, uh, what we looked during this uh, presentation or during this uh, lecture were the uh, understanding of who the pedestrian is and who a bicyclist is for whom you are going to design uh, the facility. So, what are their characteristics? And then we started looking at what are the pedestrian speed related uh, factors that are affected, uh, that uh, is affected by or what are the factors that affect the speed of pedestrians. We looked at built environment factors, we looked at age, gender and then finally, we looked at a statistical test that will allow you to understand whether there is a significant difference between the speeds of two groups that you are calculating for your site. Hopefully, that will be a, a, a very useful tool for you and we look forward to having you in the next lecture module. Thank you.